yeah, well, again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I believe I was invited onto this stage because I have kind of a, an unusual journey to get to this point. Um, I'm an independent experimental artist um, working under the pseudonym Metageist Online. Um, and I believe I was invited here because uh, uh, I discovered Tilt Brush and Gravity Sketch beta after purchasing my first VR headset um, a little while ago with HTC Vive, in fact. And um, having never used any desktop 3D software before, I was motivated more by this sort of experience and the creative freedom that you can gain from jumping into these spatial design tools. I found myself using Gravity Sketch more as a tool of performance and a, and a um, therapeutic safe space, really, uh, to express myself away from distraction. So I'll start with a little bit of a background. I'll try to get through this quite quickly, but uh, I think it's important to sort of understand that uh, <laughs> I hadn't done anything 3D at all until I put on a VR headset. So um, yeah, I'll move through this bit uh, and uh, talk to you about this uh, wonderful community of experimental artists who uh, I've met uh, inadvertently lined the foundations of what I believe to be the, the sort of future of the metaverse. So yeah, uh, mentioning the metaverse and crypto and NFTs uh, can sometimes be met with groans from the audience, but I believe this is often down to misconceptions and uh, old narratives. And if we can keep an, an open mind, we can become more aware uh, that these are in fact quite lazy catch-all terms that can represent wildly different use cases. Since leaving well school pretty much uh, in around 2000, uh, I've been trying to tap into this all consuming urge to create and find various ways of utilizing this energy to sort of pay the bills, essentially keep the lights on. I work for various different design studios and web design companies. I actually uh, designed the front end of the UK's first internet banking site and I uh, was there for sort of like the dot com boom. Um, and I ran a few companies too, I ran a website design company for seven, seven years but uh, really enjoyed myself in later years as a freelance illustrator and as a community artist. This is my old website header. I haven't touched my old website for about nearly three years now, um, but I was designing album covers, painting community murals and corporate murals. And later on, I was trying desperately to see if I could earn money from VR art tools, which was uh, tricky given that I didn't know anything about any 3D processes. So uh, during this time, I felt a real need to share these spatial art tools with other people. It was a part motivated by the fact that I saw the inevitability of these processes replacing desk bound practices and that traveling with this expensive kit that schools and colleges couldn't actually afford at this point. Um, and sharing my joy for the tools was a way to earn uh, a little money and uh, share my love for tilt brush and gravity sketch. I took it to art clubs and I took it to schools. I went to colleges up and down the country. Bear in mind, this is this is a case of like taking the HTC Vive, a tower PC, and um, the uh, light, the light stations, all that sort of cumbersome technology around. Um, and I actually set up my own events as much as possible. So you can see that in the top there, there's a picture of me in a skeleton suit for one of my Halloween club nights. Uh, I used to run a club night called Flux, where we'd have live DJs and we'd have a virtual reality arcade and augmented reality flyers, um, and just trying to do an experimental mixed reality club night. And I did that. I did sculpting on stage, and that's something I still do to this day. And I experimented with 3D printing my sculptures. And uh, you can see that uh, some of the best stuff I did was working with the children. You can imagine kids were especially blown away by painting and drawing in 3D. And these uh, hand painted Google Cardboard headsets were especially adorable uh, addition to my workshops. And then this happened. So I had two festivals lined up uh, for VR performances along with two other community projects. And I was doing charity work in VR as well. I was actually uh, taking the Vive to hospitals in London to the terminal, terminal wards with the children there, working with a charity called the Bright Futures Children's Charity because I firmly believe that VR has a lot of therapeutic potential. And as you can imagine, people who are bed bound uh, get an awful lot out of being able to play with tilt brush. Um, but all of this stopped abruptly. I sure as hell wasn't allowed into any hospitals, let alone schools, and all the festivals were stopped. Um, and then I saw somebody sell a tilt brush render on Instagram um, for a few hundred dollars worth of crypto. And then I had to just dive down that rabbit hole. So like you've likely heard of NFTs already, 
The tokens themselves can be attached to anything from a low effort cartoon profile picture or in-game items, or they can be used uh, for virtual real estate. And now people are selling houses attached to NFTs. There are a million different use cases for provably rare, immortal, immutable certificates, but I'll be focusing on art and specifically my own experience of the crypto art movement. So it's essentially what we're talking about here is ledgers. Okay, so ledgers have been around for 5,000 years. Um, this one was used to keep a permanent record of the ownership of non-transient assets like land or buildings. The blockchain is the modern equivalent. It is, of course, digital, but its strength comes from the fact that it is decentralized and therefore not held on any single server, making it more or less impossible to delete. You could argue that if the Earth was caught in a wave of solar flare, we would lose all power and we'd lose the blockchain. But then if we lost that, we'd have bigger concerns. It's just a simple doc, uh, a diagram just to explain decentralization real quickly. But the fact that it is decentralized is important, not only do, due to the fact that no government controls where the value is created and stored, but also that no gallery or centralized institution of any kind controls the art people choose to tokenize. By tokenizing or to steal a term from the legacy banking world, to, by minting your art, you create a stamp in the immutable transparent ledger that dictates that the art mentioned in the entry is indeed your own. It has a parent and a birth date and it can never be changed. A lot like a physical painting, but without the need for a separate certificate or all the other clutter needed in the physical world. When someone buys it, the same immutable token is left unchanged, except it moves to a new wallet to join an art collection. So as you can imagine, in the 14 years since the Bitcoin was created, there's been a passionate culture has grown up around it. The Bitcoin story itself is pretty incredible. Uh, it's not something that I have much interaction with, but it is where this started. It has been avoided being silenced through having no single point of attack and is now being bought and held by all the largest banks, governments, institutions and hedge, fund, hedge funds around the world. It is an accepted truth. It is here to stay and it is compared to other stores of value like gold, land and valuable artworks. And I believe the same can be said for Ethereum, which is what I will be talking about more so, and the broader concept of NFTs. Ethereum being somewhat more centralized, but far more powerful as a programmable money and settlement layer of the internet, which has just finally seen a much anticipated major upgrade, making it more energy efficient than any other payment service on earth. One of the criticisms of NFTs and the technology around them was that the carbon footprint was huge, but since the upgrade, that is no longer valid. In fact, um, I learned today because Starbucks are about to launch an NFT uh, reward system that um, for the amount of energy it takes to make a coffee, you can mint about 18 NFTs. So since Bitcoin arrived, people have been making art to help try to share the message with others. And roughly five years ago, people started sharing tokenized art with each other for free and then selling it for tiny amounts of cryptocurrency. On the left, you can see a piece of art by a friend of mine, Josie Bellini. She was one of the first people trying to make art about Bitcoin, motivated by the fact that she'd been working in the financial sector for many years and saw an opportunity for people to be able to hold self-sovereign value that could not be blocked by a bank or by a government. It could be held in your pocket, essentially on a USB drive. And in some countries, that's an extremely powerful thing to have. On the right, we've got a collaboration between Da Vinci and a lot of money which was bought at auction for $1,600 in 2020, uh, which of course was a huge deal because up until that point, people were really just giving up to each other for free, having fun collaborating and selling them for much, much less money. Just want to draw attention to just a couple more pieces before I get into my work, but uh, this is the one that sort of really, really opened my eyes to the potential of, it, of this technology. The uh, digital artwork here is uh, by Matt Cain. It was created using Matt's own software. It is comprised of 24 layers and changes every day based on the price of Bitcoin. So essentially it's, a, it's alive and it's got lots and lots of Easter eggs buried in the code, depending on what happens in the future in terms of the volatility of the currency. This piece broke records. It sold for $100,000. Um, the async platform that this was built in is incredible. I could do a whole talk on it, but essentially it means that Say, for instance, five of us wanted to buy a piece of artwork, we could buy individual layers of that artwork and then we could edit it on the fly. So you can create canvases that can be changed by the collectors. So the collector has a certain amount of ownership and actually whole communities can form from within a single piece of artwork in that way. Here we've got another friend of mine, A.L. Crego. Uh, this piece was uh, put in a uh, group show that I curated. Um, 
I share this one not only because it's been it's beautiful, but also because Crego has been creating and uploading animated GIF loops for many, many years before there was ever a culture that truly valued his digital native artworks beyond stealing them and sort of reposting them on Tumblr. His portfolio was prone for crypto art and he's been an incredible success. And now with Adobe incorporating token metadata creation and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Reddit all adding NFT display and minting into their platforms, we'll finally see all digital art having the option of being immutably linked back to the original creator. So yeah, I, I was learning about this. This is all stuff before I started to make my artwork for it, but I was trying to understand like where the benefits lie and why this was a thing. And of course, um, in, in buried in lockdown with no other work, it was something I was able to do a lot of research on. But there's a lot of reasons why it's worth considering this as a digital creator. Um, for a start, if you're comparing it to the contemporary and fine art worlds, there's no need for any physical items, but you can still share the value of limited edition prints without having to create print and post um, potentially lose the physical artworks. Another point is that digital wallets can include whole worlds. And by that, well, we'll see at the end of my talk, in fact, you can anything can be an NFT. So you can mint an entire immersive 3D experience, create it as an NFT and then sell that. Um, there can be rare one of one artworks, but uh, they can actually, so one person owns the artwork, but of course, as far as they're concerned, whether they bought it because they feel like it's going to be valuable in the future or just because they love it, it's in their interest to allow the artist to show it all over the world, even if it is just a single token attached to it and it's treated like it is a one of one physical item. It can actually be teleported at light speed around the world and shown on various different screens and different sizes at the same time, regardless. So you can have it in lots of different gallery shows at once while keeping it rare. Uh, there's no middleman, there's no gallery, no one's taking 50%. The artist generally gets about 90% of the money. Um, and you know where your art is at all times. At any point, I can check on any of my tokens and see where it is. I can also see the current market value based on what the collectors are selling it for. So you get an idea of how your career is doing and how you're doing in terms of the value of your art in the broader ecosystem. And the most important one, every time a collector sells your art onto another collector in the future, you instantly get 10% secondary royalty on that sale price. So if you blow up in the future or if somebody decides that a piece of your artwork is extremely valuable and they buy it off another collector, uh, you're, it's written into the contract that you get 10% royalty. So that is something that vis visual artists haven't had before. So what I saw was basically a opportunity to just have a load of fun. So after lurking and learning in the space for a month or two, I wrote this article on a crypto art focused blogging platform called Scent as my little hello. Um, this is this is a scribble that I did in Tilt Brush, essentially. I say scribble, but uh, undermines it a little bit, but it was that's, a, that's all it was. I outlined who I was, how I felt that by valuing digital artifacts as if they're physical, I saw a match made in heaven for someone who painted art inside a VR headset. Long before it was possible to mint anything other than images and videos, I set out a battle plan to create what I termed metaverse native sculptures. I see the process of using spatial design tools to create limited artifacts akin to being a blacksmith in the metaverse. So I popped on my HTC Vive one night, set to making whatever came into my mind. This is essentially my process going forward. I just, I just draw and see what happens. Um, and this was my first NFT. This was the Astro Shaman made in Tilt Brush. And this alien creature rides a spaceship through the cosmos and be between realities. Like it literally does go between realities. The video was minted and a 3D model was collected by the prolific artist Coldy. I signed his name inside the cockpit before sending him the 3D file and creating a little AR activation. It sold at auction for 3.2 ETH, uh, which was about $700 at the time. Considering I wasn't sure where my next rent payment was going to be coming from, this was a pretty big deal to me, and I was suddenly hooked. I doubled down on creating whatever came to my mind while wildly flailing around in Gravity Sketch, and it's a process that I have not stopped exploring. So here you can see examples of Gravity Sketch sculptures that were minted on Supero and sold to collectors for displaying in VR. The one on the left, the ETH Hopper, was brought by the crypto art storyteller Tubador on behalf of Metapurse. Metapurse later on went on to spend $69 million on a single NFT, catapulting NFTs into the mainstream the following year. The ne Neon Anemone on the right, which was when I first fell in love with radial symmetry and gravity sketch, which you'll see I use a lot, uh, was brought by my friend Jamie Fox, who we'll talk about in a bit. I actually you can see here down in the bottom left, I don't know if the compression is sort of ruining that a little bit over the call, but um, 
we had events in the metaverse in uh, VR chat. So yeah, I, I made these sort of quite naive little creatures, but when you put them in uh, VR at large scale and give them sound, sound effects, um, and then invite your friends around, it becomes a very real um, entity of sculpture. Here's a few more works. I made a graphic sketch. A recur recurring subjects are masks, giant insects, sentient portals inspired by biomimicry and bioluminescence. As is always the case, I just put the headset on and I start doodling until I see something come together. But with a bit of luck, you can see I'm starting to understand a bit more about 3D modeling, like in rendering. But I'm still using the stroke tool pretty much <laughs> exclusively. Cool. So then this was the, this was a really cool bit of fun. Um, around this time, I was making it clear that I was new to 3D modeling. My art would stay affordable for the foreseeable future. I wanted collectors to know that they were buying my art at the very beginning of my journey as a sculptor. Mesophila were my first blind pack collection, all created in improvised gravity sketch sessions with no real plan other than to be inspired by the toys I grew up loving in the 80s and also by early life forms of Earth Carboniferous period. I wanted to see more wildlife in the metaverse. Basically, I'm seeing lots of utopian stuff, lots of sci fi stuff, lots of hover cars and um, uh, yeah, skyscrapers and lots of cyberpunk things, but no one was showing any love to the ugly bugs of the, of the world. So I wanted to sort of draw attention to early life forms. And of course, they sort of suit the first collection of small models from a, like a, a budding sculptor sort of making his way in the space. They sold for $60 each. There was, uh, you didn't know which creature you were going to get. There was 275 of them and they sold out in about half an hour. It was a crazy night. These drops happened at midnight UK time and I was up until the sun rose, reaching out to all of my new collectors, sending them 3D files for 3D printing and displaying in AR and watching the secondary market come to life. After the initial sale, there have been 1,107 secondary sales. They uh, have currently raised $55,500 for their collectors. And of course, with each of those sales, the original artist gets 10%. So I would wake up in the morning, have three or four emails telling me that I've made 10% of each of those sales. And that carries on you know, into the future. Uh, that's one of the 3D prints of the Yellow Jelly, which was one of my collectors making a print of him, which was really cool. So this is one of those characters. You can see I've just like... You can see my brush strokes basically. I've been using the stroke tool and made it symmetrical and created this little hermit crab guy. Um, there's, I think there's 10 of him, something like that. Currently, I can see that the lowest asking price on the secondary market is one and a half grand. So it's always great to be able to see exactly how much is being valued uh, by your collectors. This is the sprite. <laughs> uh, regular gravity sketch users are probably gonna laugh at this. Um, I, I was asked at short notice to um, do another drop. I had a couple of weeks, um, but amongst other responsibilities, it was quite a tough call. But I set up the camera in Gravity Sketch and I created some shapes and I recorded my screen and I sped it up. So essentially I'm, I'm not in the video here because I'm invisible, but that is in fact me puppeteering digital creatures and making them transform. And I added a uh, sound, soundtrack to that as well. And then my next collection was around two of the Metaphyla. Each of the eight designs was an evolution of one of the first pack. This collection was 250 Blender renders of Gravity Sketch models, sold out in under a minute and raised $166,000, 140 of which was money paid to my collectors rather than me. I realize it may seem like I'm focusing a little too much on the money, but I really want to make sure that uh, people understand that this market with all of its volatility and hurdles is full of people wanting to collect digital artworks. And yes, the collectors will um, will often be more interested in flipping for profits that, than enjoying the art themselves, which is both a bug and a bit of a feature in that it has kept the fine and the contemporary art worlds alive over the decades. They're still investing in you and they are motivated to share your work within their circles, leading to a new collectors further down the line. So you know, it's still investing in you and you're still allowing you to develop. I also firmly believe that being your own truly weird self, making whatever art really calls to you is rewarding, is rewarded by collectors who above all are actually looking for originality and artistic integrity. There's just a couple more of these. The jellyfish that you saw in the first one, this is his second step of evolution. So there's eight strands of story going back through the law between eight of the different characters. He's now starting to 
find himself. He's become a bit of a monk. We've got the uh, light ray. This was actually this is actually a one of Paris Hilton's favorites. She tweeted about it, put it on Instagram and stuff, so it got a lot of traction. Um, these have been also handed out to the collectors, and they're in a bunch of different metaverse spaces now. You have to sort of optimize them for different spaces, but they're flying around different worlds. This is the hermit. We saw the hermit earlier, the weird little crab guy. He's now got a little uh, temple on his back, and uh, we'll see a bit more of him later. But I've actually turned him into a fully immersive environment that you can run around and put your art up inside of now. So, of course, the other side of the story is the collecting. I have collected many artworks now over the years. I actually was collecting art before I got into NFTs, but um, only really my friend's artwork in the local vicinity to try and support them. Um, but you very quickly run out of wall space and um, it, it's kind of embarrassing knowing that you're putting your friend's artwork in the cupboard or down behind the sofa because there's no room wall space anymore. Um, I, you know, I felt bad about that, but um, now I've got nearly a thousand pieces. Once you've collected your first rare digital artwork, the penny kind of drops and you realize that knowing that you own that token and have supported an artist in the process, it feels good. Most of the digital art collection is on Ethereum, but another blockchain of note is the far more underground Tezos chain. Back when Ethereum was still energy intensive, um, many artists flooded to Tezos to mint green NFTs. It's a term now that's more or less defunct as all NFTs cost the equivalent of a tweet in terms of energy terms. But the culture of creating and collecting on Tezos lives on and some of the very best artworks can be found there. The culture is less about rare digital items, rare single one of ones, and more about minting 100 or 1,000 copies for the equivalent of sending prints just without the hassle of having to post prints. This is actually a fraction of my art collection. Like I say, I've got about a thousand pieces I've collected now. And what you find is that artists are very, you know, giving. They want to support other artists. They all know what it's like to sort of talk, come into the space and not know whether you're going to be accepted. And it's very hard generally to make money purely as an artist, especially when you're working on your own. So you see this like real beautiful circular economy and this sort of like trickle down effect from the larger collectors and buyers making profits and then buying more art. And then so the cycle continues. I will see uh, an example of how I actually display them in a bit. Um, here are some, a few more that I've collected along the top there. They are uh, read by Render Fruit, Victor Mosquera, Robbie Trevino and Tina Eisen. Um, but the images along the bottom relate to a couple of curation gigs that I had. Um, so First Dibs, I don't know if anyone's heard of First Dibs, but they've been selling fine art to avid collectors around the world for decades. And it was crazy for me to be able to invite my friends in and see our names on the platform alongside the Warhols, and Picassos and Dalis that they also sell. On the right, oh yeah, you can see also I built a gallery in Mozilla Hubs. So what we do is you, you curate the show, you get the art of the artists, you invite them to a show online in like a spatial 3D environment where you've put the art on the walls. Then you invite collectors. Collectors come around and with one click, they can buy the NFT if they're interested. These all sold out on the, on the, on the first show. We did two shows. And on the right, you can see just a photograph of, the, of a show I curated in New York last year. Um, it was for Metapurse. Again, Metapurse of the collector that bought... Uh, boosted NFTs into the mainstream with their $69 million purchase. Um, <laughs> this, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but it was a crazy night. And uh, also Angie Taylor is on that list here. She might be in the room now, but uh, yeah, she's, she's someone else who uses Gravity Sketch and makes NFTs and is like a, yeah, a force to be reckoned with in the space and much respected. So artists from all over the world and all walks of life and all mediums are being pulled together by this shared belief that in the 21st century, it makes absolute sense that there should be value held in rare digital items and artworks. This melting pot can create some really rich and unusual collaborations. Here's a piece I made of Jamie Foxx, who was brought, who bought my neon anemone that you saw earlier. I saw his macro photography on Instagram and I reached out to him and I just said like, mate, you need to look at this crypto art thing because your art will really go down well. Um, and he followed me down the rabbit hole and he's been, he's, he's been incredibly popular and sold hundreds of artworks. Now, this is, this is so cool. The, the one on the left is the model I made in Gravity Sketch. Again, playing with radial symmetry. I, uh, I used the mannequin to uh, get the hand right and uh, started using the sub D tool to make the hand. 
And then I sent Jamie, I think he's in Canada. I'm in the UK. Um, I think it's Canada. Basically, he's nowhere near me. I sent him the file. He 3D printed it at about a centimeter, centimeter and half across, submerged it in transparent resin, and then injected ink into the resin and took this photo. So this is, a, this is obviously a very, very high resolution macro photograph of colored ink working its way around resin, around a 3D printed gravity sketch sculpture. And it sold at auction. And we plan to collaborate again. This one was the Cyclops. Now, this is another really weird and interesting collaboration. This is something that I wanted to do for years. Um, I really wanted to do a 3D printed sculpture with an augmented reality uh, utility. But I honestly had no idea whether anybody would be interested in buying it. And it just sort of sat in the back of my mind and in my sketchbooks for ages. Um, it's proof of concept, something that I'm working on in in the background at the moment, I've been working on for a year, is a much larger version of this sort of thing. But we've got 21 pieces sold. They were sold straight away within a, under a minute on the, the Nifty Gateway platform. They were all made, designed in Gravity Sketch. There's 15 bronze, actually cast, cold cast in bronze, five pearlescent, and one of them is uh, gold leaf. And you can see that what I did here, I don't, you probably can't read it on the, on the left there, but um, I curated a show of artworks through a sculpture that my collectors could enjoy. They went to um, all over the world, basically, Germany, Spain, UK, America, and one in Australia. Here I am in Gravity Sketch making the model. Word of advice, um, make sure that you've got an airtight mesh in the center if you're going to be making something for, for 3D printing because it can get really messy. You can see that I uh, print it, printed it at home. Then a friend of mine, James Howlett, uh, helped me create these. Made did an absolutely wonderful job. Made the mark, the, the the tool, and then we printed them. I'll skip to the next video because it's a bit better. So yeah, you can see here how the augmented reality works. That's a gravity sketch hand, and it is attached beautifully to the AR marker. So what I did was I curated a show. A bunch of friends of mine, basically, in the in the crypto art space, asked them to provide me with 3D models and links to NFTs. And then every Friday, my collectors who owned the sculptures on their desks or mantelpieces would be able to get the email, go to the sculpture, use their phone, and see what 3D artwork or 2D artwork was delivered to them. Um, we've got a bunch of different artists here. Celia Thorne is an AR artist that I work closely with still. And uh, this one's really cool. It uh, turns, points at you and casts a spell, flips the camera on your phone, points it at your face. And then you see, he's got a mask on here as well, but you see those hands coming up over the chin. So it's this nice little interactive spell casting thing. This is Sutu. Um, this is a really cool piece. Yeah, he's someone I've never met, but I collaborated with him across the NFT space. And this is Trippy Yogi, made a little Cyclops lobby monster. So there, yeah, you know, around there, a little bit after, I continued with this the thing, but I wanted to try to start world building. So I wanted to try and make characters that were a little more, a little more relatable. So I started to make some more humanoid things. This one was made in just a wild session. I was really angry when I made this. <laughs> this is the soothsayer. Um, these are... Um, they're basically the naive digital creatures of my first drop are starting to grow up and find their feet. These characters all represent further evolutions of the metaviola that, that you saw at the beginning in the little toy packs. Um, they're metaverse native creatures exploring the edges of a simulation, writing life into existence as they push forward through the sandstorms at the edges of the metaverse or something like that. I don't know. I'm working on the law. Um, this is the uh, jellyfish. He's now turned into the cedar. So he was a monk and now he's ascending. And it's stopped animating, but you get the gist. Now, this is the Basilisk. Um, similar to function in the Cyclops, but with a single digital augment made specifically for the collector. This saw three very different artists collaborating on a one of one auction piece. I once again created the sculpture more or less entirely with the stroke tool in Gravity Sketch. After printing it, I had it weighted and then I had it electroplated in gold. I'm going to click to the get to the next clip. Pause it a second. Make sure I've got sound. Um, hopefully you can hear that.
Yeah, so um, this is a really weird one. Um, I commissioned my friend, Mr. K. Steels, to create a cinematic artwork based on the song that was written by Varian, who is a platinum selling DJ and producer. Uh, again, uh, Varian is someone I, at this point I hadn't met in real life, but we uh, connected online for our shared, of, our shared interest in certain types of music. Now, those patterns that we see in the eye, those are cinematic patterns. This is a video um a live uh, a video recording of water so they're taken from a video recording of the vibrating water surface as seen from above that pool of water in the center here is tiny it's uh, resting in a toothpaste cap and it has been placed on a speaker playing the song that varian wrote it's obviously a lot more complicated than that when it comes to capturing it and lighting it well but essentially the eye of the basilisk is a real world uh, video of the song being played in water showing the uh, sacred geometry found in nature essentially so you get some beautiful shapes it's something that mr k steels is is still pursuing at the moment this sculpture was actually stolen from the gallery in manhattan on the night of the gallery show that i helped curate which obviously sucked it's also kind of hilarious i mean it looks like something that is stolen in an indiana jones film after all um, it's never never been found, but it did sell the following day anyway at auction, and um, I had to obviously re re remake it. What was interesting was that I, I replaced the AR with a different message for the thieves, and that's what they've got. And then I made a new marker and a new AR activation for the one that I remade. Um, I sent it to the buyer, who was more than happy to wait for the physical. He was like seemed like he was more interested in the NFT. So that provokes really interesting discussions about where the value actually lies. Cool, we're just getting to the end now, just showing me, showing you some of my latest pieces. I'm really fascinated by the metaverse. Um, I love creating these portals. I'm inspired by nature, uh, again, by like unusual and sometimes seen as ugly nature. So I like deep sea animals and I like insects. And I've started to create these portals that are inspired by, um, yeah, uh, carnivorous plants and bioluminescence and uh, biomimicry rather, um, because I'm starting to sort of really worry about where the metaverse is taking us. And I think it's something that we need to be wary of. So I've started this collection of different portals that have different sort of utility. And this one's designed to hypnotize you and force you to climb into it and then slam it shut behind you. This is the flickering veil. This is one that uh, is actually still for sale on first dibs. It's the only NFT that I've got left up unsold. Unsold. It is a basically a death portal. The idea is that in the future there will be portals in the metaverse that can wipe your digital identity and, and allow you to start again. So you'd have to stand in front of this and you know walk through it and wipe your digital existence and start again from scratch. And that's what the, the flickering veil is. And it's actually been made in 3D. It's a, it's a space that you can visit and walk around and run around. And on the back, there's lots of very sharp teeth. This one is the Lepidoptera cowl. This was a commission. A friend of mine commissioned me to create another portal in the series for her. Um, it is designed to look beautiful, like uh, something like an owl. It, uh, you can visit it and it beams you up. It's actually built in a, in a monoverse space that you can actually walk around with a number of people now. Um, but the back of it, you find it is actually another insect pretending to be something it isn't. Um, added functionality is that you can also wear it on your face. So in closing, the point I've been trying to make with this talk is that not only are there free and accessible design programs like Gravity Sketch out there that can make it possible to draw in 3D easily, but there are also a growing market for original artwork and a world of opportunity for individuals without the need to rely on the gig, the gig economy. I've worked with complete autonomy without deadlines or amendments. I've been paid instantly upon collection, sold nearly 800 artworks and connected with artists all around the world from the comfort of my home. There has never been a better time for digital artists, storytellers and world builders. And as AR merges with VR, I believe these artifacts will begin to feel more and more like tangible objects, especially if they're valued by an art market and they exist on rails outside of centralized platforms and are treated more like rare artifacts than throwaway game assets that disappear when the platform they've been tied to loses traction and disappears into obscurity. Psychologically, a rare token of authenticity adds weight and substance to an otherwise infinitely copyable asset. 
And now I'm going to take questions while I show you my new art gallery, which was built entirely in Gravity Sketch. Well, wow, thank you so much, um, Lee, for, for your beautiful work. Um, there are so many on this that it's impressive, it's questions. So I'll get started a few, and then I'll invite uh, for the Q&A. Asking a few, and, um, what programs do you use in conjunction with Gravity Sketch to produce some of these images? Uh, everything I'm using is free. So I just basically use Blender to uh, texture and to light the models. But uh, other than that, that's it really. I use Unity. This was built in Unity as well. So um, that's free as well. Mm, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, Gravity Sketch entirely for modeling. I don't, I don't ever model anything anywhere else and I don't um, buy any other assets. You can kind of tell. And um, same with this avatar guy as well. He was made entirely in Gravity Sketch um, and he was just rigged using Mixamo and, and uh, yeah, Blender for texturing and lighting and stuff. Um, what's your workflow to get your sculptures in, in AR and to mint them? Yeah, so one of the one of the restrictions with AR is that um, they generally the platforms, for instance, Instagram and uh, Spark Studio for Snapchat, they uh, have very tight file restrictions. So what you need to do if you want to get something that comes out of Gravity Sketch down to the uh, if it's a complicated model, then it needs to be down to like four megabytes. Um, and then so that takes a little bit of effort. But uh, yeah, again, these are all free programs. So I use my, the, my favorite one. Well, Lens Studio for Snapchat is great. Like it's incredibly powerful. The problem is like Snapchat is it seems to be less popular, whereas a lot of people, most people seem to be on Instagram. So I use Instagram Spark AR. And then when it comes to minting, there isn't really anything that like mints the whole AR activation on, on chain, but you can mint the image that is the marker. And then as time goes on, you may have to replace the way that the AR is activated, depending on whether or not the software you're using is still around. All right. Um, what are the top three things that contributed to your success in the NFT market? Um, having this like unabashed enthusiasm for it, um, having nothing else going on. <laughs> so being able to live and breathe it 24 seven and, and connecting to lots of people and uh, showing up in the community, buying other people's art, on, uh, like helping people when they get stuck with it. Just being generally, you know, just like the real world and anything like networking comes from just being generally in the spaces and in communities with other people. Um, so there's that and there's timing. Like when I first got into it, Ethereum was only $300. Then it went up to nearly $5,000 in that period. So you can imagine that it, you know, became very, very, very good time to be working. That is um, on the way down again now. Basically, it follows just like any kind of cycle, really, like the stocks and share cycle. The uh, crypto market does the same thing. So it, it peaks and troughs. And now we're like right near the bottom, as far as we can tell, uh, with a, another bull run, maybe in a year's time, who knows. But essentially, like being on the on the up run in the market is definitely helpful. So there was like a bit of a gold rush for NFTs for a while. Um, because they were new and shiny and people were making lots of money very quickly. So, you know, timing is really good. But um, despite all of that, I'm still here for the long haul. And I think it really just comes down to I was already making digitally native work. Right. So it might be different if you're a watercolor artist or, or whatever, like the crowd that you're appealing to. Are you, are you digital, di digitally native? They're futurists. They believe in this technology. And of course, my artwork sort of sort of buys into that as well. So there's, there's lots of factors. But um yeah, I like to think that it's because people just find my art enjoyable, uh, taps into nostalgia for them as well. And I'm doing experimental things and being weird and experimental is just rewarded. All right. I would love to welcome Constantina to the stage so she can ask a few questions as well. Hopefully she'll be joined. Hi everyone, Lee. Hey. 
I mean, your presentation is crazy cool um, and okay. great to hear that you're also in the UK. Uh, <laughs> we yeah. should meet up. But... Okay, yeah, that's that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Daniela, thank you. Essentially, I have a couple of questions. I mean, I have been watching the whole NFT community, the artists, how much they have taken advantage of the whole kind of like explosion in that. But I also hear a lot of um, concerns. And I think that was one of the questions in the chat as well. So how, how have you managed to protect your IP uh, through all of this um, kind of like digitalization that you described? And um, did you experience anyone like reselling stuff or taking screenshots and then uploading it as a 2D art or even kind of like making it physical and then, I don't know, reselling it as a physical uh, 3D object. What's your point of view on that? Uh, yeah, I've, um, I've, I haven't seen evidence of that happening at all to anybody, but I'm sure it does happen. Um, I'm sure, mm. it, you know, in, in the same way that anybody can still uh, download a JPEG and sell it on Etsy or Redbubble yeah. and, you know, um, I, I haven't really been concerned about that. I actually think that personally, although this, you know, some people would probably disagree, that I'd have to wait and see how I reacted if it ever happened. Um, but I just think it just gets your artwork out there more. If if somebody steals your artwork and 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 it gets propagated around the internet and more and more people see it, but you've got the NFT, you've still got the original NFT. Um, when once people are called out for minting other people's work, their their wallets are shut down, and, and of course they they lose any kind of credibility in the space so it helps to show your face it helps to mint your artwork you know first and and you know it, it could be a case of somebody could uh, re-mint it but if you're the one to mint it first then of course you've got that indelible immutable proof of the blockchain that you were the one that minted it in the first instance um but yeah i mean it's, it's a concern but it, it was a concern before blockchain you know it's just that now that some now these items are just can become much more valuable so it is it is, yes. a, it is a concern because of that that's amazing i guess there is i'm i can't i I am on the tech for uh, creative kind of like space and mainly on the tech startup. And I guess what you're just saying is very similar to kind of like stealth startups and getting their name out there. Like you can keep your uh, idea secret forever and kind of like never uh, get exposure. But actually, if you get out of stealth and you launch, yes, maybe you have competitors or people who will try to steal it. But actually, this never, like very, very rarely happens and you get a, a huge amount of exposure. OK, amazing. Um, the other question I have, which also was um, co like common with the, the channel, is except a Gravity Sketch, which I am realizing has been the kind of like one of the game changers for your work. Do you mm -hmm. use any other software to kind of like finalize or kind of like work on your uh, 3D models? Yeah, I do. I use Blender uh, uh, quite a lot now. I've, I've learned a lot of Blender over the last few years in terms of um, texturing, uh, working with materials, um, and also optimizing. Um, I can also, like you can see with some of my work, I've been using. I, I build up volumes using the, the the brush, the stroke tool. So you end up with lots of like if you look up at this this uh, light ray up in the sky she's full of ge geometry that really doesn't need to be there like anyone who works in games would like <laughs> yeah, they'd get angry in the state of the model um, but i've learned now since that you know about optimization so i do that in blender although actually it's much easier now in gravity sketch to make sure that uh, that you've got optimized models and then yeah rigging for the avatar is done in blender and um yeah, so I, it, it, my my thing is Gravity Sketch with a blender, but like these textures were actually came straight from Gravity Sketch. So I use PNGs um, and JPEGs. Uh, I replace the colors with um, gradients, and then so when I actually bring it into Blender, I've already got the colors and gradients I needed because I do that in Gravity Sketch. So I've just got a whole library of different gradients and textures that I bring in. Um, and I find that I really like that because it means what you're seeing in Gravity Sketch is more or less what it's going to look like. But that's because it suits my style, obviously. If I was doing something with much more texture, that would be a different story.